the probably the the best uh, slogan to start out with is the one which I actually mentioned I think uh, <clears throat> a week ago uh, that the late professor Quisper of Holland uh, mentioned to us he said that the uh, uh, Gnosis is an experience that is inevitably turned into myth. Now that is a big statement and requires some uh, uh, explanation, which he did not give. So we have to, <laughs> so we have to give it ourselves. And uh, I think probably the best explanation is that in order to uh, understand a certain uh, circumstances, conditions, uh, images, uh, beings, which are outside of the material and the, the earthly realm, it is necessary to employ means that are probably less frequently employed in the material realm. So when it comes to matters of uh, what in modern psychology we call the psyche, which is after all just the Greek word for soul, uh, and uh, kindred uh, um, conditions and kindred beings and circumstances, then it is important for us to uh, uh, affinitize ourselves to the subject of myth. Now, uh, uh, mythos in Greek, as, as I remember from so many years ago when I had a couple of years of Greek, really just means a story. And uh, it is... Uh, a story or a tale whereby uh, truths are communicated. Now we are saying exactly the same thing that we did before in a different way, through which they are communicated, which cannot be uh, communicated adequately in any other way. And in so in this way, when we are interested in the uh, Gnostic matrix, in which, of course, uh, we can easily include ancillary uh, uh, schools of thought, such as Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, and the subsequent manifestations of the Gnosis, like magic and uh, others, Katarism, for instance, Manichaeanism, that when we add all of these together and extract from them the principal mythic themes, then we uh, are likely to come up with the following four, which I think I mentioned last week, namely the first one, which is the one we are dealing with in this series actually, the myth of the journey of the soul. Uh, the second, the myth of the eternal feminine, which includes the, uh, the Sophia myth uh, embodied in many Gnostic scriptures. The third, the myth of the savior, or Logos, which is certainly um, embodied in various ways, although not always very clearly, and without ambiguity in uh, orthodox or uh, mainstream Christianity. And finally, the myth of the demiurge that everybody is afraid of, but that is nevertheless of very great importance. Now, um, of these, uh, certainly of great uh, uh, imp importance, and subsequent influence is the myth of the soul. And in order, in order to uh, uh, mention this myth in connection with the 
the famous mystical poem, the Hymn of the Pearl, uh, it is uh, perhaps uh, useful to recall that uh, one of the uh, biggest questions that human beings have asked themselves and they are still asking themselves and apparently not receiving uh, very satisfactory answers to that question is a sort of a double question why am I here and where do I come from? The two obviously being interconnected. And in that respect, we find really wide and uh, glaring differences between various spiritual traditions. Uh, and uh, uh, it is important, therefore, to pinpoint as far as we are able uh, with our mortal minds uh, the, the Gnostic uh, answer to these. The monotheistic religions, which are the greatest culprits in this respect, in many other respects too, uh, namely uh, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, with maybe some of their, their satellites, have really the, uh, you would say, uh, the least uh, satisfactory answers to this uh, big uh, myth or mythic question as to why we are here and where we are coming from. Because certainly if we take, as so many people do, uh, the uh, myth or the creation myth of Genesis uh, in seriously, uh, then uh, uh, we come up with a very curious story. As Madame Blavatsky said, a story that is replete with uh, uh, trees that give strange fruit, uh, with talking snakes, uh, uh, and other things that make even less sense than that. Uh, then on the other hand, other monotheistic religions we take uh, Islam, the latest, uh, and there uh, the only sentence that I remember because along with many other religions I used to teach uh, religious studies, comparative religions in school, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be on his soul, said that God created man out of clots of blood. Now I, wow. could, now, I could see that uh, the blood might be involved subsequently to the creation of the human because it, and of many other animals, because after all, that is what moves around in us. But to place it in that uh, context, again, is a little bit uh, different. And of course, the Judaic uh, uh, creation myth is but an ancestor and a relative of the Christian one and therefore falls very much into that same category. Uh, so therefore, uh, it is needful for us to begin with, and I'll try to make a short shrift of it as I can, to uh, uh, present a little explanation of uh, the uh, creation myth, if it can be called that, of uh, the Gnostics, which in many res respects has great similarities with uh, uh, the spiritual traditions of that uh, historical period of the Alexandrian period, namely of not only of Gnosticism, but of Neoplatonism, uh, and uh, uh, and some some others, because you need to remember, for instance, that uh, in the ancient world, and in many respects, the medieval world inherited that Plato was regarded as a divine personage, and he hardly ever was mentioned in antiquity 
without an epithet of the divine Plato. And so all the, the thought world that derives from Plato uh, has a, uh, a transcendental uh, value and a transcendental regard. Now, getting away from Plato, uh, you know, let us say that uh, really present in the number of uh, ancient spiritual systems, some of which I mentioned already, especially the ones that were first proclaimed in uh, Alexandria and Egypt in the so-called late antiquity, uh, we find uh, certain common denominators and these of course uh, we also find in what is uh, often regarded as uh, the Gnostic systems. And among these is the uh, idea that uh, the uh, cosmos and the human within the cosmos and various other creatures uh, uh, in that cosmos were not uh, uh, sort of created or manufactured in a brief fashion, but that uh, the, we need to look at a developmental uh, model, a developmental sequence. This is the one, incidentally, since you know, I always like to refer to dear old Madame Blavatsky, whose picture is back there, and her disciples Annie Besant and others, uh, because this, we are really their guests, you know, in many ways, this being the Theosophical Society. But I, uh, Blavatsky certainly pointed out that uh, the, uh, uh, there was a, a development that it, it, it wasn't a, something that just happened suddenly, but that uh, existence being uh, developed uh, in some fashion. Now, unfortunately for Blavatsky and for some of us, the uh, buzzword for development of any kind almost in the late 19th century was evolution. What the preachers nowadays pronounce so sonorously on the radio and in the, te in the television, and not without uh, uh, a little uh, idea behind it as evolution. Yeah. And this, of course, uh, came about as a, uh, uh, a symbiotic uh, union of the uh, biological theories at that time very uh, fresh uh, and new of Charles Darwin and of various other uh, theories and ideas which uh, uh, passed for being uh, scientific. Uh, Madame Blavatsky incidentally and the 19th century occult revival uh, were not uh, worshippers of, uh, of Charles Darwin. Uh, in fact, one of the most uh, humorous uh, images that always sticks in my mind that the historians recorded that in New York City, in the apartment which Blavatsky uh, and Colonel Alcott occupied, in now, there are still, still about few few chairs here. Uh, so in, in, in the New York City apartment, where the Theosophical Society was founded in 1875, uh, there was a curious object in the foyer. And this object was a uh, taxidermized ape monkey business, you know. And this uh, taxidermized ape was dressed in uh, uh, human evening clothes, and had a top hat on, uh, white tie and all that sort of thing. 
and underneath the statue, if you can call it that, was the inscription Charles Darwin. Uh, so uh, let's say uh, uh, evolution was not a dogma with the esoteric tradition, far from it. The esoteric tradition really always advocated an idea of a rather different nature, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, to some of us easier to relate to and to others undoubtedly not. And uh, I'll try to describe that very, very uh, briefly to you. And don't blame me for uh, uh, mistakes or overstatements or understatements. I'll try to sketch an overall picture. Uh, the, uh, uh, the image, because that is what it must be, and the, the mythic image of the esoteric tradition is that there is a, uh, an eternal, timeless, ever-present, strange reality in being, I won't even say in the universe. And that this strange reality, which in Blavatsky's secret doctrine is uh, named the eternal parent, uh, uh, from time to time manifests. At other times, it's quiet fairly understandable position. That's how we like to lead our lives. We, we wouldn't want to be asleep all the time, but we surely wouldn't want to be awake all the time, especially in the kind of world that we live in. Uh, so uh, uh, there is an, an, a strange underlying pattern of uh, activity and of quiescence in reality. And uh, we can, uh, if we have some uh, uh, capacities of self-observation, then we can see that in our own lives. If we uh, don't find the time sometimes in the evening, usually not on a Friday night when we leave here, because we like to stick around here as long as we can, at least I can, but generally, uh, 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 we uh, finally find that uh, we have to go into what uh, in the secret doctrine of Blavatsky and in some Hindu traditions is a pralaya, a state of quiescence, a state of co cosmic or transcosmic sleep. But on the other hand, there are also periods of awakening and of activity. Now, Jumping a little further over, what uh, appears to be the uh, psychic reality. And uh, I mention psychic reality because to make this too concrete is uh, a big mistake. When, when spiritual things are materialized by people, they lose their uh, import and they lose their spiritual qualities. And one has to be careful about that. That's my objection against a lot of the 19th and early 20th century revivals of the esoteric tradition, wherein people were in love with uh, uh, the world they still are. Oh yeah, sure, even in the White House, God help us. Uh, they are still in love with the word science. Oh, science, science, science. Rudolf Steiner, a great representative of the esoteric tradition, you know, even coined the German word. You have to know German to see a little bit of the incongruity of it. It is Geistige Wissenschaft. Not Geisteswissenschaft, which is an academic term, but spiritual science. So matters of the spirit can be treated scientifically, heaven help us. Uh, but let us say uh, uh, what we need to keep in mind I mean, amidst all of these uh, uh, strange attempts to understand 
the ununderstandable uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the what apparently takes place and here again I have to call on our intuition as I try to call on mind on my, my own uh, to uh, uh, get at least even a glimpse of that. And what I'm trying to express is that somehow out of time and out of mind, out of any reality that we know, a, uh, an eternal, more than eternal, a timeless existence begins to manifest, begins to come forth. Uh, the technical term, especially by the Kabbalists for this, has been emanation, which comes from the Latin emanio, to go forth. So from a secret place, or from a place of no place, something comes forth. It comes forth and continues manifesting. And we, uh, according to uh, these traditions, we, we find ourselves sort of at the farthest point from the origination of that emanational sequence. We are way, way, way out there at the periphery uh, and uh, we don't remember where we came from. We have all kinds of ideas, but we are, let's put it that way, uh, in a, in a colloquial fashion, we are, we are way out there. We are way out there, very far away from the original reality uh, from whence we originated. And yet, in spite of that, we call it distance, we can call it uh, uh, emanational uh, sequence, we could call it whatever we want to, in spite of that, there is always a con connection between the point that is farthest away from the origination and the origination itself. Now, owing to the fact that we are humans, at least I hope we are, uh, uh, we, we like to use metaphors that are uh, familiar to us in our uh, circle of activity. And therefore, the ultimate point from whence everything emanates, the source, the, uh, the ultimate fullness, has very often, and even in the, in, certainly in the hymn of the pearl, is referred to as the Father. Now, I know that the feminist sensibilities won't like that. But on the other hand, you know, uh, feminist or masculinist, or uh, by nowadays we have all kinds of genders, uh, you know, uh, a little bit like the, the little kid is supposed to have said long, long ago, he said, how many, they asked him, how many sexes are there? And he said, three. Uh, the male sex, the female sex and the insects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this comes from a, uh, at least I heard it on the radio program of a, a once very popular radio announcer called Paul Harvey, God rest his soul. Uh, I, I listen to a lot of programs of his. But let us say, you know, whatever, the, whatever the differentiations may be, there is a source and this has often been called father, has been taken over by the various mainstream religions and eventually like in Christianity, again, copying some of the patterns of the inner world, so to say, uh, came to be called as God the Father. No, uh, uh, enough of that. Uh, we know that Dario is up there. And we, will, and, you know, and we will encounter him here and there uh, in our story too, because uh, for reasons that really don't concern us at this point, the, the paternal keynote has been sort of the, uh, the, the big buzzword 
about where life originates. There are reasons for that, and they are partly because the ancient peoples, and even now the uh, so-called primitive peoples, uh, don't, uh, uh, don't really know how uh, life is a combination of the masculine and the feminine, but they looked upon it as originating with the masculine. All right. Now, away from that, so we are talking about this strange emanational development that out of a small beginning, which however has within itself tremendous potencies, there flows forth into the void. A, an ongoing uh, a series of systems of reality. And each one of these systems of reality has within it beings of some consciousness. Uh, and they in turn interact with each other uh, and maybe they uh, make uh, noise on uh, uh, telephones or things of, things of that sort. No, it wouldn't be impossible. Uh, but in any event, uh, Madame Blavatsky was, was right. Uh, uh, life is ubiquitous. Uh -huh. Very interesting. But I, I don't seem to be able to discern any meaning in it. Uh, so I'll go on. But uh, let us say uh, what could be called life uh, in a much more complex and much more transcendental sense is everywhere. In, a, in, in its own way, everything is alive. And no doubt everybody is alive. But in, but only in their own way. And so uh, when, these, uh, when these life forms uh, interact with each other, meet each other, they have uh, various uh, uh, problems and uh, various insights. Uh, and uh, that must be understood. So, uh, the, let's say, the, the ultimate image of uh, this one life, as uh, a theosophist, my, my theosophical friends often call it, of that one life is an, an immense series of um, levels of reality, each of which is alive in its own way, each of which is, has uh, what here on the human level uh, we call consciousness of its own way. And they interact with each other. All right. This being the kind, uh, it, it tends to reason, if we accept that kind of reasoning, that there are differences in, uh, well, how could we call it? the intensity of reality, the liveness of life between those, uh, uh, those portions of reality which are at the beginning of this tremendous sequence and the others which are at its end. Now, if you wonder, all oh, right, I already spoke about the beginning, God the Father, and so forth. So what is at its end? Well, pretty much at its end is, is our we, who sit here in this room and elsewhere. We are the, uh, we are the stone that has been thrown the farthest from the original stone thrower, whoever he or she may be. Uh, uh, we are the farthest away from the source. No wonder that, as the spiritual says it, we sometimes we feel like a motherless child. 
because we are so far away from our origins, we are so far away from, we may have life, but we are so far away from the source of life. We may be conscious, no doubt some of us more than others, uh, uh, but we are less conscious or have a different kind of consciousness to many others. And so um, what I would like you to imagine, and I don't, uh, I don't put these things forth as fact, first of all, because it has been my belief for a very, very long time since I was a child that facts are utterly unimportant. And I led my life that way, and uh, hmm, maybe I made out okay, maybe not. At least I stuck around a long time, <laughs> you know. But um, uh, the factual uh, manifestation of the, the great uh, reality is the mo one that is the farthest away from the source and that is also really the least enduring and the least important. Uh, I could go into some detail there, and uh, very, very quickly I think I may. The factual manifestation of the et eternal reality is the one that is uh, discerned with the senses, and uh, therefore is a, a reality of sense a reality that is disclosed by sense, but doesn't go any further. It is the kind of reality that we observe, that we smell, that we taste, that we touch, it doesn't go any further. And then there is another one, and this is the one of the reality of feeling. Now that's uh, a lot more active, because we can uh, contact various forms of manifestation for reality and we can feel about them in various ways. Uh, if uh, there's a great deal of difference between uh, uh, going to a good Hungarian restaurant and eating some goulash, uh, you know, uh, or whichever way it was produced privately or otherwise, or uh, I don't know, uh, eating a, eating an unseasoned pile of beans. Now, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, a, I, it, 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 it's, it's a big difference, I assure you. Yeah, and of course, how do we discern that difference with our feelings? It's, I feel positive about this, I feel negative about that. All right, that's the feeling. And then, uh, at least we on the human level, and probably to some degree or extent the animals as well, uh, we start thinking about what we have sensed with our senses, what we have seen, what we have smelled, what we have touched, uh, so forth. I have left out one, I probably have, uh, on the one hand, uh, and what we what our feelings disclosed. So you see, what, what is the difference? And then we, we begin to do something that uh, Auguste Rodin so beautifully immortalized with his thinker, who is sitting there in that park in Paris, very quietly, yeah. Le Penseur, the thinker. Yeah. And like most thinkers, he just thinks and doesn't do anything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so there comes, and no doubt, you know, it's a very important function, because there are many, many situations in life which, in order for us to make it, to survive, uh, and to uh, accomplish various things, we need thought, we need thinking, but then, Somehow, this is the nature of the human, 
even though we exercise these various functions, and what I've been doing here, I've been reaching into the, the functions of consciousness that Jung has uh, brought forth, uh, we then, uh, you know, we are still not, we are still not satisfied. We have contacted something with our senses, we have felt about it, we have thought about it, but you know, it's still, it's still inadequate. We're still not, we are still not satisfied, because Rhoda may have thought that we are le penseur, the thinker, but we are more than a thinker. Mm. Yes, we are a thinker also, but we are also a feeler, we are also a seer, we are also a smeller, we are in all of that, and then what? Something else. Then we begin to move into regions of um, uh, consciousness, of uh, the, the activity of consciousness, which are uh, a, little, a lot more subtle. It's hard even to find a meaningful name for them. One of them is intuition. Well, what is intuition? I, I challenge most anybody to give me a good definition because I haven't heard one, I haven't read one uh, uh, at all. But let's say again, a, a, a faculty, a, uh, a function of consciousness that uh, is not covered by any of the others. And dissatisfied creatures that we are, even when our intuition functions fairly well, which in most people it doesn't, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult uh, function to deal with. Nevertheless, you know, even that is not the end. Mm -hmm. So what comes after that? After that comes something that Jung called the transcendent function, and the ancients called the well, if they were Greeks, they called it Pneuma. If they were Latin, they called it Spiritus. If they were Germans, they called it Geist, Spirit, and Spirit. And the reason why that became such an important uh, concept and term is because you know, it is related in terms of meaning with what? With breath, Spiritus to breathe in. My Geist is my spirit. So, uh, and there I think is a secret that most people have no, uh, uh, no understanding of is that without the spirit, without that strange quality, that strange function, which is the one as we rise on that uh, on that uh, ladder up, without that, we are not really alive. It is a pseudo life that can only think, or that thinks that thinking is the top. It is a pseudo life that can only feel. It is a pseudo life even more so than any others that can only sense only when there is at least some, some little touch, some little contact with that highest of the functions, which reaches where? To the Gnostic, it reaches into that, that vast uh, uh, panorama of manifestation of which we live on the lowest point. It's there. And then, we are really alive. Then we are, uh, why? Because we are con in contact with something that is life. It's the very life of life. Not only a manifestation of life, or life of a little dog, life of a little cat, life of uh, um, this kind of a person or the other, but the life of all life, 
the real life, the life that, that comes from a mysterious source and that is present in all. It is the, the one that Annie Besant in the habit here sometime, but uh, in a beautiful little uh, poetic meditation called, which, which starts with, oh, hidden life vibrant in every atom. Oh, hidden life moving in every creature. I, mi I wished my geriatric memory was better so I could use the recital, but it's in, in many books. Yes, hidden, hidden, and yet very much present. It's very, very important. Now this being that, so I tried to sketch for you now what really the esoteric tradition, certainly not only the, the Gnostic tradition, but that the esoteric tradition has recognized as the image of reality. Because as, as we enter this, this uh, well, the only way I can, can define, it, define it like a, a, a strange spiritual pyramid. That's obviously only a, 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 an image. But, but not a bad image because it has a point, one single point on top and then it spreads out. But as we enter that, uh, that uh, pyramid, then we encounter innumerable varieties of reality, innumerable beings, level after level, stage after stage, world after world. This, and it goes on and on and on until it eludes our comprehension, eludes our sight, because there is the ultimate point, the Parabrahman, uh, beyond Brahman, as the Hindus call it, beyond even the deities that we know, the ultimate reality from which all the realities and partial realities have come. Now, why did I why did I stretch, why did I try to sketch, um, after all, my grandfather, my great-grandfather were painters, so maybe I would know how to sketch. My mother was still a better artist than I am. But uh, in any way, uh, when we contemplate this, and when we acquire a certain contact with it, then, uh, there is only one uh, legitimate reaction, and that is utter amazement. Now, of course, the next thing that you will say in your amazement, how come he claims that he knows all this? You know, what kind of a, what kind of a bundle of menacity am I? You know, uh, and uh, well. I could be highfalutin about it, um, and I'll start out because I've been there, and because I have some impressions of what it is like. That's number one. And secondly, because having had some, no matter how minuscule, uh, personal experiences, I also know that uh, uh, these experiences in turn have been uh, present in the consciousness of many, many people over the ages, and that with their consciousness they made descriptions, they made works of art, and they made theologies and theosophies in order to gain some kind of a conscious awareness of all of these multifarious realities. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's a very romantic and uh, beautiful picture, haha, uh, and so forth. Well, you know, yes, romantic it may be, at least at times, uh, and beautiful it may be at times, but you know what? Not all of it is all that nice. And uh, this, of course, is a, a great stumbling block for the person who uh, 
enters the study or is in the study of the esoteric uh, tradition. You know? If this is the uh, world picture, what the German calls the Weltanschauung, the, the cosmoconception, as Max Heindel called it, of the esoteric tradition, then how come it's not all beautiful? How come it's not all lovely? How come it's not all kind and loving and, uh, and all that? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> you know, well, about the own, you know, there is no, uh, no human logic for these things. But uh, one can approximate it a little bit with certain elements of human thinking and let's say it is, uh, it makes sense that if the ultimate source of all things is uh, pretty much perfection, then the farther away you emanate, you, you go from perfection, then less and less of that perfection is present. And so it's it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem strange to me that at uh, the farthest levels of the emanational sequence, where according to the tradition we really find ourselves, uh, there are a lot of difficulties. And even what uh, we refer to as evil. If you ask the Lord Buddha, who certainly is much of a Kautama, the Buddha, much of, much of uh, uh, great representatives of the esoteric tradition. I was just reading a very quintessential little book on uh, Manichaeanism and how highly the Manichaeans regarded Buddha and how much the, the Buddhists, particularly the Chinese Buddhists, came to regard the Manichaeans, and they refer to the prophet Mani, is a very Gnostic prophet, as uh, uh, Mani Buddha. So what did Buddha say? Buddha said, suffering. Wherever you go, you see suffering, you see pain, you see unhappiness. But fortunately, he also indicated, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. If your consciousness changes adequately, and if you, uh, well, we would say with this little scheme that I outlined, if we get to that uh, uh, transcendental function, uh, if we get to that esprit, that spirit, then uh, things change. There is a certain kind of approach, a certain kind of understanding, a certain uh, a sort of shifting of gears inside that takes at least uh, most, if not all, of the suffering away. And so Buddha said, if you uh, are interested in not suffering so much, kiddo, I don't know whether the word kiddo was part of his vocabulary or not, <laughs> but you know, then uh, you should become enlightened. You should become enlightened. But you see, we, we don't really want to. We're afraid of it, or we don't know what it is, uh, or in various ways we try to uh, evade it. I remember one of the one of, well, every, every one of his talks was magnificent. But one of the magnificent talks that I heard in person by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in, in Santa Barbara, and uh, uh, where he said a lot of important things, as he always does, but in one of them was to the effect that, uh, well, somebody said, well, you know what, uh, uh, if you, uh, 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 if you become uh, enlightened and so, and if you leave, leave the uh, incarnation or sequence, you're not reborn again, you know, then you, you can't be here to do anything, to help anybody. 
and I could just see the wrinkles on Dalai Lama's head and say, oh dear, now I needed that question. You know, but but he, he came up and he said, my friend, first become enlightened. That's what you got to do. You got to become enlightened and everything else will follow thereafter. Without that, nothing. With that, everything. All right? <laughs> <laughs> in any event, so the, the radical change of consciousness, which as which the enlightenment of the Buddhist can be uh, explained, uh, that explains it all, that brings it all. Without some of these changes of consciousness, you literally have nothing, even though you run around try to find something. But if you have them, then you have everything. And everything is there, and, and all the questions are answered in a way which, in which they are a real answer, because they are all come from the, the bodhicitta, or whatever you want to call it, the Buddha mind in the individual, and not from anywhere else. Now, why did I bring all of this up? Well, I'm beginning to ask myself. But I brought it up primarily because the, uh, the uh, rationale, such as it is, of the monomyth, as I called it, because I think it is, the myth that really includes all the other myths of the Gnostic tradition, which is a sub-tradition, shall we say, of the esoteric tradition that that uh, is uh, a, that is contained in what I just spoke of that the uh, the kind of reality within which we live which has sub realities and and all sorts of being and you can call them gods and you can call them angels you can call them all sorts of things uh, but let's say they are all there, and there are also uh, disturbing elements. And that the disturbing elements, you can call them ignorance, you can call them evil, whatever they are, they have to be overcome by way of the informed and the insightful efforts of uh, the wise, the good, the benevolent elements. So a, uh, an element of discernment, an element of discrimination, and this is, doesn't have anything to do with politics, you know, but that, which in Sanskrit is called vairagya, incidentally. Uh, uh, an element of discernment uh, arises and is extremely important and with the help of that discernment, you can then uh, uh, bring about some very important and very radical improvements in your life, and consequently probably also in the life of others. Enlightenment, wisdom, whatever we wish to call it, gnosis, a knowing of something that previously maybe we just intimated a little bit, a real knowing is of extremely great importance. And we can gauge the importance by the fact that so few people have it. That the overwhelming majority of uh, beings who consider themselves conscious a stupid as all heck get out. <laughs> Dummheit, Dummheit über alles. <laughs> German. Now, uh, uh, hopefully nobody takes this personally, uh, uh, but Krishna Murti, who was uh, quite an interesting gentleman, I have a very beautiful picture book about him there. I heard him many times, but I never met him personally. Uh, 
Mr. Krishnamurti very early in his life, and he was he was a little boy, I think, when he wrote uh, the mass the foot at the feet of the master. And I think already there he wrote, in all the world there are only two kinds of people, those who know and those who don't know. <laughs> now, of course, it's up to you to interpret what you mean by knowing. But let's say in the Gnostic sense, we have a capacity within ourselves to see beyond the uh, limitations of um, our own particular consciousness and to, uh, to kind of look out beyond our immediate horizon. Because we have a knowledge, a knowingness, a gnosis within us right now, which way exceeds everything that we think we know. But we have to be in touch with it. We, we have to cultivate it. We have to, and when items of it come to us, we have to trust it. There was a very interesting gentleman who spoke here several times. He was a British uh, philosopher uh, and writer by the name of Gerald Hurd. Before he came to America during World War uh, II, uh, he was a sort of a, I don't know, kind of, uh, philosophical commentator on BBC, which probably nowadays would not be possible. Because now you have to be stupid to be on, on, on radio. But not at that time. And Mr. Gerald Hurd was uh, one of the truly wise men, uh, I would say, whom I have met. And uh, Gerald Hurd uh, always indicated that there has to be a, an ability to know. And that this ability to know is, 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 really our, uh, it is really our salvation. It is our liberation. And that we can and we should know with the totality of our consciousness. He said many, many other things uh, too. <laughs> but let us say, um, I just to kind of remember that, because having been here for so many years and in this room for so many years, when I sort of turn my head over that way, I see, uh, I see the specters of some of the interesting people who were here and who were speaking to us. Um, and Gerald Hurd was certainly one of them and his close friend, the great writer Aldous Huxley, was another. So, um, it is, we have within us the capacity to know, but we have to exercise it. We have to approach it with intelligence and reverently, and then we may join that group that Krishnamurti is talking about, those who know instead of those who don't know. Now, why did I go into all of this big uh, rigmarole here? <coughs> Well, I think I, uh, uh, what I was trying to present was an overall uh, image, a, uh, a, a super cosmological image of reality as envisioned by the esoteric tradition. Because if we have a notion of that reality, then uh, the uh, events, the processes, the dialogues, the activities that are present in that beautiful monomyth, the hymn of the pearl, become uh, helpful, become open, become understandable. And so that is a very, very important uh, issue. Uh, and why is that? Because what do we understand with? Do we un I've just mentioned them before. Do we, do we understand with our eyes? Not necessarily. Do we understand with our ears? No, not necessarily. And not even by the uh, 
the concepts and precepts that we uh, that we absorb, but we understand with a, a strange mystery that is within us. A strange mystery that even now, as far as we have journeyed from the source, as far as we have, uh, if you want to use that uh, biblical term, fallen, uh, or maybe parachuted from on high, from the high consciousness to the low consciousness, no matter how far we have gone, it is still there. It is still there. Well, it's not difficult to uh, get hold of. It's not difficult to admit that it is there. It's even more difficult to have other people admit that we have got it, because that puts us into a exalted category over them and nobody likes that. Nobody likes anybody who is better than they are. You know? Nobody likes anybody who is smarter than they are. No. No, we don't want that. Well, you know, you know what? Whether you want it or not, it does happen. I mean, I'm very sorry to admit mea culpa, mea culpa. But I met a few people in this long life who were smarter, who were smarter than I am. Hmm? I would have rather not met anybody, but, but I did. <laughs> so, you know, that uh, happens too. But what we have here is that, uh, and this, this, these uh, uh, axioms, let us say, are, uh, uh, they are uh, very much present within the, the esoteric tradition. And one, one of the axioms, let's see, is the fact that no matter how far you have gone, no matter how far you have traveled or far have fallen from the fullness, from the origin, a strange and mysterious contact with the ultimate is still within you. And this is not just life, this is the life of life. Maybe this is the hidden life that may be vibrant in every atom, but is also vibrant in every human. And that this, uh, this mysterious uh, consciousness in turn has to be recognized, has to be utilized, and uh, if at all possible, has to be uh, brought into a real, clear, and workable, and useful consciousness. That is why uh, uh, of all the people over the ages who have uh, written about the Gnostics, mostly their enemies, uh, people like Irenaeus and Tertullian and so forth, of all of the, those people, I think the ones who uh, who hit the nail really on the head, and one of them was Carl Jung, he said, these were the only people, the Gnostics, whom he encountered, well, not physically, but whom he encountered, who uh, knew that reality resides in the psyche. That the, that's where you have to look for it. Not on the top of the mountain, not in, uh, uh, in, a, in the basilica or in the, in the uh, uh, synagogue, but within, in the psyche. The, our psyche, our soul guards an incredible pleasure. And it is this pleasure that is uh, an impaired treasure that is called attention to and that is uh, made to become active in uh, the midst of the hymn of the pearl. I read some of the, the verses to you last time, and I'll read them again, but here is a, 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 a person, a being is talking in this beautiful treatise, and he says that when he was just but a little child, he lived in his uh, parents' home, in the, in the transcendental world, in the transcendental heavens. 
and that then he was asked by his parents to go forth to leave that uh, beautiful and pleasant and glorious heavenly world and go down into the material realm and to fulfill a particular task. It's not an experience that should be uh, foreign to us. Um, I have mentioned once before, and again I don't know why this should interest anybody, that uh, I had a distinct, as a little baby I had a distinct memory that they didn't want to come to this world. It took me several months to uh, kind of be reconciled to this weird place where I have come and uh, said, well, all right, if I have to, I have to. Well, boy, I sure don't like this place. Uh, so uh, the reason I bring this up because uh, uh, we are uh, maybe contrary to our uh, conscious knowledge, but we are sent on missions. This brings up the, uh, the issue of messengership, which is a very important one in the Gnosis, and particularly in Manichaeanism and some of those branches. And it has to do with the fact that we, uh, uh, we uh, are, in various ways, from time to time, maybe all the time, sent forth from uh, an immaterial, transcendental, non-physical, non-intellectual, non-emotional reality into this reality. That we are sent forth to uh, accomplish sometimes one thing, sometimes another. In other words, we are messengers of another reality. And uh, I don't mean to say that we have to become a channelers and things like that, which to me is a, a, not a very pleasant uh, concept. Uh, that's, that's not the issue. The issue is that we uh, uh, have to accomplish something. Not anything physical. We mistake it for something physical. but. Most everybody, every time, is, uh, doesn't just come here and is born here, hopefully, uh, uh, is born here, but rather is uh, sent here. Sent by who? Well, next question, please. Uh, but let's say sent by a higher power, as C.J. Jung called it sent by something superior to what we are and where we are. And that being the case, sent for a purpose. And so we have the, the, the beautiful poetical metaphor that this little child is up in the heavens, up in the, at the top of the, the great pyramid of reality, and there, by his superiors, by his parents, is asked to uh, go down to the earthly realm. In fact, the, the uh, code word for his destination is Egypt. And we mentioned why the, re the reasons for that, both physical and otherwise. Because, uh, well, there's really, you know, everything that's, uh, that's real in existence has uh, at least two sides. That's what alchemy will teach you. It's never just the king and it's never just the queen. It's never just the sun and it's never just the moon. It's never just uh, uh, silver and it's never just gold, but they're both there. That's what makes life interesting, but also doggone confusing. Uh, so, uh, uh, what, what happens here is a, uh, uh, the, the child is asked to uh, do something, to go down into uh, 
the land that is a long, long ways from where he is, and to uh, find something there, and to bring it back to the transcendental realm. Now, once again, you know, it's a very nice fairy story. And that's the sort of thing that occur in uh, fairy stories, that a uh, little boy goes out uh, uh, somewhere, and then uh, he finds a treasure there and brings it back, or at an adult and uh, different historical level, uh, Parsifal and uh, Lohengrin uh, go out and they uh, deal with the Holy Grail and so forth, the great treasure and so forth. It, it's the, the same kind of uh, thought behind it, but here the thought is that there is, there is apparently something, although the, that part is never mentioned, why the pearl? which he is to find in the depths of the ocean. Why that pearl is valuable to the heavenly kingdom? Why those at the, at the top, at the apex of the pyramid, want that pearl? And of course, uh, we can speculate and we can uh, come up with various explanations as to within our circumstances, what the pearl might be. But first of all, I think it's maybe important to keep in mind that even if you feel about this world the way I did much of the time, and uh, then, uh, you know, when you feel that way, then the worldly events uh, come to justify your position. So uh, I was there when the Russians came to Hungary. I was there when I saw I walked on, on dead bodies this high on the street when my father was shot, you know, all kinds of things like that. So let us say uh, we, come to, we come to know what is on in the world, but there is also something else. And throughout all that blood and darkness and stupidity, a misunderstanding then goes on, there shines a distant light. And in the hymn of the Pearl in poetic fashion, that is described as a treasure, as a pearl, that is in the depth of the waters and is there guarded by uh, one of the terms, the translation is a snorting, but a roaring serpent. Well, that's probably is because if they, if, I mean, I've been around a lot of snakes, and so have you. You live in the Hollywood Hills, they're all over the place. So, you know, uh, uh, you, you, can, you can come in touch with a hissing serpent, but when you come in touch with a roaring serpent, then the chances are you're going to skedaddle away. Uh, but, you know, let's say, uh, uh, a, uh, let, let's say this treasure, is guarded by a being, which is sometimes sometimes called a dragon in some of the translations and other circles. Somehow this treasure has to be gotten hold of and taken back to the heavenly kingdom. Apparently it is something that uh, is needed there but on the other hand is not present there. So it's kind of, a, kind of a strange paradox. Something that is not found in heaven, if you want, if you want to use that term, and something that uh, uh, is found at the same time in the depths of the sea in, in, in this land. Why should that be? For, of course, uh, you know, symbolisms are complex, and we could go on looking at the various symbols, but maybe some of you ladies like pearls, so we might as well say a little bit about it, that uh, the pearl is by definition, as it has been said, the pearl is the tear of the oyster. So uh, in, the, in the deep ocean lives it, little creature called an oyster. 
and well, this is just uh, so-called science. So when uh, uh, an irritant, an impurity irritant enters the enters the uh, shell of the oyster, and something forms there, and that what is formed is is the oyster. And those clever people, the Japanese, led by a, a very clever gentleman by the name of Mikimoto, uh, were the ones who discovered how to create uh, um, artificial oysters. Put diving into the deep sea, finding the oyster, and putting a, some kind of a little irritant into the oyster, and it will form a pearl. So that's just a way of exploiting that particular situation. And uh, unfortunately, every jeweler will tell you that these uh, artificial pearls, industrial pearls, are way lot more regular and therefore way lot more beautiful than the old pearls that are the natural pearls. But in any event, uh, it's the tear, it's the uh, the exudation of the pain of the oyster. Now, what does that bring up? It brings up Buddha and the elements of suffering. That out of the suffering, when one is able to uh, uh, get a vision, get an understanding that uh, supersedes the suffering, then you find the treasure. So once again, somehow, the suffering and the treasure are connected, like in the enlightenment of Buddha. If you uh, handle the forming uh, pearl in your oyster appropriately, then maybe uh, things will go better with you. We have to uh, we have to derive, and I think this is particularly interesting. We have to derive something beautiful. We have to extract and extricate beauty out of suffering. Now you might say that's not going difficult to do, but. Uh, I'm a little bit familiar, partly by having been in some of the places, partly by having seen artistic reproductions of them, that uh, humanity was always suffering. There were always wars, there were always revolutions, there were all kinds of, uh, well, let's say, unpleasant things. But at the same time, Humanity compensated for its own suffering with beauty. Beauty. And this is where the orientation toward beauty, the recognition of the beauty, the utilization of the beauty is of very, very great importance. If you walk into the Renaissance palaces in Italy and various other places, you think that people who built that and who were around there and so forth uh, were uh, not suffering? Sure they were. They were poor people, they were sick people, they were uh, people who were wounded in wars and things like that. And yet they created beauty. A beauty that is still there. A beauty that can be internalized and cause great uh, and wonderful transformations within us. Now, uh, I'm, I'm not going to become political, but I will. Uh, uh, but it's not not uh, uh, not a present the uh, uh, politics, shall we say? What beautiful thing has Joseph Stalin and Vasily Ilyich Lenin created? What beauty? None. None. Ugliness and suffering. Mm -hmm. and see, because there, there has to be, there has to be someone there. There has to be a messenger from a deeper world who says, "Oh yes, I'm looking for the pearl. 
I'm looking for something beautiful. I'm looking for some something that although it may have originated in 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 suffering can bring delight, can bring uh, admiration, can bring a sense of the beautiful. It's very, very important. So here is the here is the little boy in heaven and he sent to the lowest uh, level of reality in that cosmology where we are in order to find uh, the pearl. And of course we'll, you know, we'll read more about it, but let me, you know, just to tell it. He, uh, meanwhile, this, this also entails considerable losses on the part of the heavenly boy because they are going to take away his beautiful cloak that he wore. Uh, they are going to take away all kinds of beautiful things that he have, has and say, all right, you go without these because you have to leave these things here. And he does. And uh, in fact, uh, you know, when we read the text itself, it's as he goes level by level, at the various various levels are the people who take away um, take away the beautiful things from him. His toga, because it's he uses the Roman system, you know, a toga is not a, an ordinary piece of clothing. And the Romans, for instance, you know, they they wore a kind of a glorified underwear to begin with, a unterhosen, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, then over that they wound all of this material that was the toga. And the toga had various emblems on it that indicated their rank. Mm. You know, for instance, the, uh, the Caesar, um, the, the emperor, had uh, embroidered uh, palm leaves and, and leaves of an other, other plant that they they grow, even grows, grows around here that I can't remember the name of it at the moment, embroidered. And the, the togas with the purple uh, um, uh, border and so forth. So uh, all of these things are taken away from him, so he's, he's, he's denuded. He becomes, a, a, he becomes without the, uh, the uh, emblems of his status and yet he continues. And then he comes to the dark land, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a metaphor because uh, Egypt had all the dark, and still does, all the dark mud that the river Nile uh, uh, brings forth, and that in turn is the, uh, the, the good black earth uh, from whence the various uh, agricultural products of Egypt are grown, including cotton, which was always the big thing, as well as other things. You know that Egypt, especially even before the Romans conquered Egypt, Egypt was the breadbasket of Rome. That's where their food came from. And that's why the Romans built ships, and there was a lot of uh, uh, traffic back and forth between North Africa and Rome, because they had to bring wheat and various uh, uh, grains and various food in so that the people in Rome could eat. It was a very important place, but at the same time it's, it's called the Dark Land. So anyway, in the land of Egypt, in the great big body of water, deep down in the body of water, dwells the, uh, dwells the uh, serpent that guards the treasure. And uh, so the, he arrives, and see, we, we can read the text uh, next time. He arrives, and uh, he's, uh, he's not, uh, not foolish. He knows that he, uh, he has to be very careful. Um, and he knows that if he, uh, uh, if he uh, consorts with the local people a lot, and takes their, uh, 
uh, becomes, uh, becomes affinitized to the locals, eats their food and drinks their drink, that things may happen. And eventually they do. Mm. Uh, and uh, what happens then? He, something happens to him which I think has happened to all of us who are here. We forget. We become forgetful. We don't remember who we are, we don't remember where we came from, and we don't remember why we are here. And that's a heck of a lot of non-remembering non like that. And so he is, he becomes an amnesiac. Uh, uh, I, I, have to, I have to look at my notes next time, but anyway, there was a, an author contemporary British author who, who, who said that all people suffer from uh, uh, amnesia, uh, sleeping sickness, and something of, in other words, that we, we, for, we forget who, who we are and we don't know why we are here. Mm. Uh, in any event, uh, that's what happens to him. And now, uh, He's in a pickle. Uh, he, he had a purpose. He sacrificed a, all of his beautiful things and his uh, residence in order to go down to this strange land. But now, as the result of partaking of the terrain where he went, and maybe terrain, uh, partaking of it in some fashion that shouldn't have been done, now he has fallen into uh, forgetfulness. He don't know why he came. He don't know what he is to do. Now what happens? What happens is, and I better, I better bring it forth soon because it's late. <laughs> you know, what happens is that he receives a letter. A letter that comes from his parents that flies on the wings of the eagle. You always have to remember the eagle is a sacred animal. The eagle is the messenger of the gods. It was the, the bird of Jupiter. And lo and behold, when the, uh, when the United States of America was founded, what, uh, what uh, creatures did they pick as the, uh, well, the totem animal of the USA? The bald-headed eagle. I had a curious encounter with one. I was in a little bitty airplane uh, coming from Orcas Island in the, uh, uh, off of Seattle out to the airport. And uh, on a tree next to the plane sat a big bald eagle. And he looked at, her, at the airplane a little bit balefully. I mean, the airplane took off, the eagle took off. Oi vey, I said in, in a Fairfax Avenue manner, uh, uh, you know, now what? But uh, the eagle didn't keep up with the airplane, so, so it was okay. But here comes the, the letter that is carried on the wings of the eagle, and uh, the text of it is uh, in the, uh, in the uh, poem. It says, remember, remember why you have come. And that's to remember who you are, and then remember why you have come. Remember that you have come to get the pearl, and remember that that is what, why we have sent you. And so uh, a, a mnemonic device of a celestial origin is presented to him, which is the letter. And uh, can we say when we look really deeply and quietly can we really say that we have not received such a letter in our lives? Maybe even more than one? Remember, remember why you came here. Remember what you're supposed to be doing. Don't do anything else. Or at least don't do anything else in lieu of what you are you're supposed to be doing. So uh, we, we have to be sensitive to the, uh, to the mnemonic devices. We have to be sensitive to the, uh, to the uh, 
letter. And it's signed by his father, the king of kings, and his mother, the empress of the east, and so forth. Very, very poetic and very beautiful. And then he remembers. Uh-huh, that's it. And goes over to the, to the body of water, and now he will get hold of the treasure. And more of that probably next time, but one thing as is probably important to remember, because you see, the, the de not only the devil is in the details, but God is in the details too. So when you pay attention to the details of these uh, highly symbolic, mystical writings, then you find interesting, interesting data. And one of these is that he, uh, you would expect him sort of like St. George the Dragon Slayer or, uh, or Parsifal or somebody to come with his sword, get that snorting, snorting snake, snorting dragon and kill him and take the, take the pearl or in some other way, you know, to uh, do that. But he doesn't do that. He chants his father's name. Now the names of uh, the high beings are high magic. Uh, to their, their names change things. So he chants the name of the, of the highest father of the, of the hierarchy. And what happens is the dragon goes to sleep. And he can take the pearl and he begins his homeward journey and both that homeward journey and various details we shall have an opportunity to look at later. But I, th I, would, I would like to leave with us, if that is possible, uh, 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 a message, a, uh, a particular keynote, and the keynote being the, uh, the issue of messengership that in addition to uh, what, we, what and who we think we are and what we are doing and what we are involved in, what families we may came from or so, that was sort of the, the big deal always in, uh, in uh, my country and so forth. But in addition to that, we need to, uh, uh, we need to recognize that we may have a one or more or a, a compendium of tasks that we are a messenger and you know a messenger is an angel mm. uh, the name for agelos in greek means messenger so that you know, i don't know whether you are willing to accept that or especially about your friends or your uh, associates well, I may be an angel, but she is not, you know, and, and things like that. But uh, we don't, don't need to occupy ourselves with that. But we are, we are all messengers of a higher power. We don't know it, but we can know it. We, we, uh, we don't know how to fulfill uh, the objective of a messengership. But if we are intuitive, if we align ourselves with the higher power, if we are sincerely desirous of doing what we have been sent to do, then the message will come. And the, uh, the letter will arrive, the eagle will come, who is, you know, even in J.R.R. Tolkien's magnificent trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, uh, and so what great role the eagles play there right up to the end when when the victory obtains and the dark lord is thrown down and uh, and the king of the eagles and the other eagles come and proclaim the victory and all along they are the helpers because the bird is the messenger to the ancient people of another world and it's very very important so uh, Let's try to do that. Let's try to, uh, let's try to remember. Let's try to visualize the, the letter as it is brought by the eagle and it will say, 
awake and arise from thy sleep. And I am not uh, changing the wording. And do what we have sent you to do. And come back to us and then you will be back in your own place and all things will be well. Because it may be uh, even fragmented among different things. You know, we may, we may be a writer and at the same time we may be uh, something else. Uh, we, may, we may have various tasks that we are fulfilling here. But underneath them all, somehow behind them all, there is some important task. There is a treasure we are supposed to find. It changes, the image changes into the Holy Grail at a later period. But there is something here that we can find, we can take on to us and to bring to the point of origin from we have come and where that treasure belongs. So we are here the, uh, not only treasure seekers, but treasure finders. And we are the magical treasure finders. Because if we find the magic, which will release the treasure to us, if we find the magic that will put the dragon to sleep, then we have found the key to our mission. And so we have to keep that in mind. We are not lacking in power. We have a great deal of magical power. We have the, we have the power that accomplishes transcendental ends, which is the greatest magic. That is a magi oat, as uh, Eliphas Levi would have called, the high magic. We have the capacity for that, and when we are awakened, then we will fulfill our mission, and we'll have the treasure, and we will take it to where it belongs, where it will be enthroned on the throne of heaven, and where it will fulfill what it was destined to fulfill. And that event would not have happened without us. So we, we need to remember who we are, we need to recollect ourselves, we need to put ourselves together and then do what we are supposed to do. And then indeed, once again, as the English mystic lady said, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Because we have a, we have a duty, we have a, we have a mission, but we have to become aware of the mission, remain aware of the mission, fulfill the, the mission, and then glory and glory and thanks will be ours. Thank you very much.